Well, hi, folks. Moving into part two of the digestive system, uh, we'll move past that introduction and we'll look at what are the organs of the digestive system, what are the accessory organs, what do they produce, and talk overall about homeostasis and just how the digestive system keeps us alive and keeps us running. So let's pop into the digestive system here and kind of an overview. We'll take a look at everything here. So of course the mouth is the opening to the digestive system, but a few things you might not have thought of would be the salivary glands. And in fact, there are three. You've got the parotid at the back, sublingual and maxillary salivary glands in us producing what's called salivary amylase, which itself makes um, swallowing a lot easier, but also contributes the key digestive enzyme um, initially, which is salivary amylase, breaks down starch into sugars. The back of the throat right here is where food will initially pass down. And if you've ever um, had a really thick milkshake and you've been trying to pull that shake through the straw, um, your pharyngeal muscles will get quite sore. So that's your pharynx um, creating that muscular sucking action at the back. And from that region, we go past the little spot right here called the epiglot. It's a little flap that decides whether or not you're breathing or swallowing. And this is when people choke on steak or when you're laughing, food goes down the wrong pipe, as they say, because this little flap can, if it's, if it's engaged, um, will allow things to only go one way. For example, when you're breathing right now, um, it's not covering up the trachea, right? It's covering the esophagus. And when you're uh, swallowing something, you want to make sure that the esophagus over here is what's covered by the epiglottis. So it's, think of it as a little railroad switcher that sometimes gets confused. Um, my brother one time inhaled a peanut, peanut because we were wrestling. Um, and, you know, he still reminds me about that to this day. I guess I deserve it. Food, though, by large, will go down the esophagus. And there's special little wave-like motions we call peristaltic waves. And they're the motion of a smooth muscle sort of with a gradual squeezing action to push food, literally to push it, to squeeze it like a tube of toothpaste, down into the stomach, which is the principal chemical um, and physical digestive organ. The reason I say physical is because if you've ever had um, an empty stomach and you've had that growling effect, um, you feel those contractions much more pronounced. Now, of course, we know about the small intestine. We saw that in our overview. And the small intestine is where a lot more digestion occurs after the stomach. Um, and then waste products will pass out through the large intestine. If you follow my cursor in this direction until you get to the rectum and then out. But there's some keen, and by keen, I mean really important uh, assistive organs that help in digestion. The liver is extremely important because anything that we digest, first of all, will take a trip through the liver to be detoxified. It would be quite dumb for nutrients taken from our digestive system to just go straight out into circulation. Because if there were toxins, if we ate something we shouldn't have, the wrong berry or heaven forbid a mushroom, right, of the poisonous variety, then without the liver, we wouldn't stand a chance of getting rid of any of those toxins. Same thing with alcohol, the liver has to process it. Um, it just can't keep up with overconsumption. Underneath the liver, there's a little um, gland, little green guy there. It's called the gallbladder. And it contains, um, a lot of people think it's an enzyme, but it's not an enzyme. It's an emulsifier. So I always remind people the best emulsifier uh, example to think of is, is soap. Because if you take soap, you can mix oil and water. And what bile produced in the gallbladder does is it allows the emulsification or the mixture of water and fat and that helps our bodies to absorb that fat because fat's nine calories a gram and we need it in our metabolic processes for so many things. So the bile that's here makes it possible for us to digest fat much more effectively. There's another organ close to the stomach, you'll see it right here, called the pancreas and it's an amazing organ. 
Um, not only does it produce insulin, which regulates our blood sugar, but it also produces pancreatic amylase. That is sort of a multi-purpose juice that can produce that helps us to digest. Well, pancreatic juice, I should say, that contains amylase um, that allows us to, to digest starch. It also contains uh, protein digesting enzymes like trypsin, and that enables us to digest. Um, uh, proteins, but we'll go through a whole list of the digestive enzymes. I just wanted to mention the big two. So here's our digestive system. Uh, it's all contained in a peritoneal membrane and all held together. And um, I'm just going to go out of full view mode here because I'm in presentation mode. There we go. And this is a neat um, overview of the digestive system not not so much an overview of something that you've already seen but this is really neat because it shows a few things and i'm going to jump around a little bit okay so of course we begin by chewing in the oral cavity so muscular action we're supposed to break up our food into a greater surface area and tongue moves around what starts to become a food bolus now at this point we enter three salivary glands okay so sublingual un under the tongue uh, uh, maxillary gland here and this is the parotid gland they all work to produce that saliva that we need to help make that bolus slimy moistened so that it it's easier to swallow okay and pause so at this point there we go at this point what you'll see is you can see the function of the epiglottis so it covered over our trachea to make sure that food didn't go down there, allowing the bolus to slip down the esophagus. Now what you'll see are peristaltic waves, and you could see them there. Sort of continuous contraction of the smooth muscles until you enter, voila, the cardiac sphincter right here. Now I really like this animation because of the view of the stomach. The upper portion, by the way, is called the fundus, um, but we don't expect you to know all the um, anatomically correct naming regions of the stomach. The, if you think back to biology 11, you remember that um, when we studied the earthworm, they had a crop and then a gizzard. So in us, we don't have a crop and a gizzard separated. Really what we have, the closest thing to a crop would be this upper region. And the grinding has also been incorporated as well. We don't have a crop and a gizzard. They're just together. And these folds right here are called rugae. And they're muscular ridges, and they enable the stomach to really grind away at the uh, food bolus, which is just entered. Now, this can be called the esophageal sphincter, but it, an older name is the, uh, is the cardiac sphincter. Now, right now, this is closed, but sometimes we get what's called acid reflux, which is when the... Um, cells of the stomach are producing um, hydrochloric acid and there's a bit of backsplash that can come up here and that that acid can burn away at the sort of the top of the sphincter which isn't protected by the mucousy slime that the stomach possesses okay so once the food has come in there's the fundus um, this is why this is called the cardiac sphincter because it's adjacent to the heart so the food will be um, physically broken down and you can see the waves of the stomach. There we go. And I'll just pause that for a second. The stomach principally will go after a couple of things. and it, One's missing here. It produces lipase, which um, if you remember ASE refers to an enzyme. So the stomach will work over fat. It'll produce hydrochloric acid, which helps to break down tough proteins and, and the plant material that we consume. And it also produces uh, an enzyme called pepsin, which is a protein digesting enzyme. Now, pepsin works best when you're around pH 2 to pH 3. So pepsin here does a great job only in the stomach. Once it leaves, it's going to be a different pH. So we're going to need another protein digesting enzyme because, as you know, protein takes a long time to break down. Okay, so there's the peristaltic waves. And this down here is called the pyloric sphincter. 
So as the food is moved down, the pyloric sphincter, once this is um, sufficiently moist and the contractions um, sort of add up, it will open. And now our bolus is a, um, basically it's an acidic, goopy mess that we call chyme. And once the sphincter opens, we'll go into the duodenum, which is very, very short, I might add. Very, very short. We'll give that a second. Okay, in it goes. So our acidic chyme arrives here, and we've got a bit of an issue. This is so acidic that it has to be neutralized. So a couple of things happen. Um, if you look at this yellow, almost like tongue-like organ right here, that's your pancreas. And you could see that the pancreatic ducts come out, these little things called papillae here. And the pancreas is going to do us a real solid by sending down a, a bicarbonate solution, kind of like baking soda. And it's going to um, neutralize the hydrochloric acid because this, this acidic hot mess here cannot stay. It's got to be dealt with. Now, it's not just going to send a bicarbonate solution. It's going to send a whole bunch of things. So, let's see here. Oh, this is neat. Um, this was the peristaltic waves I just wanted to show because it was so neat. Give this a second to load. But the peristaltic waves are important. This is why we can eat in space. This is why you can eat standing on your head. You can eat an apple very easily. So anything that we chew up, definitely want to break it down into small parts. Don't make it too hard for the bolus to go down. But if you watch the peristaltic waves, there you go. Pretty important. Pretty useful. Because in space, we definitely need those uh, to get the job done. So if we look at pancreatic juice coming from, of course, the pancreas, what the heck is in there? Well, let's take a little peek here. What have we got? We've got amylase. Now, that's not the same amylase that is in your saliva. This is pancreatic amylase. And it's, um, it digests starch, and it breaks it down into, we'll just call them sugars. We've got a protein-digesting enzyme called trypsin, which will break down protein into peptides, smaller chunks of proteins, but it's headed for amino acids. Um, chymotrypsin, which is another protein digesting enzyme to get us down to sort of the amino acid stage. Uh, carboxypeptidase, which will get us further. And think of these enzymes, really what they're trying to do is get protein down to the Lego building blocks, which are amino acids. <clears throat> There's also pancreatic lipase. Now, lipid is something that indicates either a fat, an oil, or a wax. So it's kind of telling you what it is. Breaks down fats. And nucleases. So if you have any uh, nucleic acids, you can break them down into nucleotides. So there you go. That's the list. So our small intestine, um, pretty interesting while we're looking at it here. The duodenum is just this short, short region um, that does all of the sort of final stages of digestion with those enzymes. And I want you to remember a DJ's name here. I know it sounds ridiculous, but everyone I've told it to remembers it. The small intestine, think of a DJ called DJI. What a name. The reason I use that is because the first part of the small intestine is the duodenum. The second part, well, here comes the J, jejunum. And the third part, there's a jejunum, quite a bit there, isn't there? The third part is the ileum. Now, these regions, the jejunum is largely for finishing off digestion, about a foot long. And then you would think to yourself, well, I remember when I watched that animation and it made it look like, you know, after the duodenum, it was just all absorption. Well, that is true. I mean, if the next 20 feet, um, or sorry, rather the next eight feet, is you're getting some absorption, but there's still some mixing going on. A lot of the absorption, as it turns out, happens at the ileum. And this is sort of the, really, it's the last chance to do a lot of it, isn't it? The ileum terminates with the ileocecal valve right here, and then you get into the colon. At this point, I should mention, as your food comes out here, that little structure right there is your appendix, which is a vestigial organ. Think back to biology 11. It's something we have left over from our ancestry, 
and it contains a, quite a few bacteria. It's it's a little blind sort of finger-like pouch, and its job really is, has been thought of to be sort of a little repository for a whole bunch of um, plant di plant material digesting microbes, but we don't really use it that way anymore. The problem is when the food comes out, you can get food material trapped in here and it starts to become infected and it can swell and then you get you can get appendicitis which is uh, an inflammation of your appendix and if it explodes in your body cavity or bursts um, you've got germs all over the place so it's you can this is this can be removed it's just uh, it doesn't always have to be you move into your um, your colon really is your water absorbing it um, structure and you can see how broad its diameter is so this is why we call this the large intestine okay enough said close that tab i did want to point out um just how it is that we we kind of cue in our accessory organs to help us out like think about it this way what really tells the accessory organs it's all hands on deck send your enzymes well if you recall, in the human body, a lot of communication that goes on is hormonal. So once the cells of the small intestine receive, for example, um, a, a payload of nutrients and in particular uh, lipids, they will call for backup and they'll do that using hormones. One of the more interesting ones is cholecystokinin. And this is a really kind of neat animation, and it shows how the um, gallbladder is stimulated to send down bile. Of course, um, bile is really important because if we're going to get it all that lipid material, we need to emulsify it. We need to, you know, froth it up, make it bubbly, so that we can absorb it into ourselves. Okay. And lipids contain really important subunits. Um, if you recall when we were studying it in our um, um, biochemistry unit, three fatty acids and a glycerol particle, standard construction of a lipid, right? But lipids, they're hard to get at, right? You've got this, you've got all this goodness, but you've got not enough surface area to get the enzymes in there. Lipase needs a little bit of help. So we need bile, an emulsifier, to come on down. CCK is what stimulates the release of bile from the gallbladder. Okay, so here's a really neat overview. There's our liver, and here's our stomach, and there's the pancreas hanging out over there, and gallbladder, and the pancreatic duct. Um, it's an interesting fact that the, this duct and this duct actually meet just before you get to the duodenum. But let's take a peek. All right. All right. There we go. So we'll kind of go to this shell outline view. So as the lipids come down the esophagus and end up in the stomach, you sort of see that lipase tries to get at lipids here. But all it can really do is pop around the edges. It's not as effective as it could be. So we need to break up that cluster. So we get down here. Now you have to think about it. We need to break this up so that the pancreatic lipase can get in there and do what it needs to do and break down those lipids. So let's stimulate the liver. So cholecystokinin is something that's going to be produced by the duodenum and the duodenum is basically going to knock on the door and say to the gallbladder, please send down your payload. Now, so many people get this wrong and it drives me crazy where does bile come from and everybody says oh geez you know the gallbladder produces it wrong <laughs> sorry the liver makes it and there's there's it's got some interesting products in there um it's it's an emulsifier but some of the things that are in there are, are like bilirubin and if you've heard of that before that's a metabolic waste product of breaking down our iron-based red blood cells. As we recycle them in the liver, that's one of the things that we put in bile. So some of these waste products um, help us to break down or emulsify lipids. Pretty handy. So you could see CCK for short, cholecystokinin, 
is sent through the bloodstream. Let's, it's not just traveling in space, but it goes to the liver. And basically, there's communication to the gallbladder right underneath the liver that it needs to squeeze a little bit and send the bile. So there's the bile. Bile emulsifies the fat. Now it's got a, a much greater surface area so that when lipase from which is one of the pancreatic enzymes sent down in the in pancreatic juice lipase can get in there and do the job so it's pretty important so the overview lipid cluster step one heads for the stomach once we get down to the duodenum there's uh there's a feedback loop this is a positive feedback loop folks and cck is sent through the bloodstream travels up to the liver gallbladder bile is sent down that helps to emulsify and the lipid cluster is busted up so that we can get it into our bloodstream. So if you eat like a double Whopper with cheese, CCK is going to be all over that. Okay, because there's, there's a lot of fat in that burger. It's probably what makes it taste so good. But we need to break down those lipids so that we can get them in our bloodstream. And really just kind of an overview. Poor lipase in the stomach can't get the job done. Down we go through the pyloric sphincter, CCK, send bile, here comes. And now the pancreatic juices, which contain lipase, can get the job done. And it's just that simple. Ta-da. So really, without, um, without cholecystokinin, you'd have a hard time uh, breaking up the, the most, one of the most important nutrients, which is fat. True story. Okay. So as we take a tour through the digestive system, we've seen quite a few of these organs looking at what they do. Uh, coming back to this now, because there's always a story. It's really a neat animation because what you can see is sort of the rest of the story. There's the acidic chyme and the, the pancreas, which looks to me like a big tongue. It always reminded me of one. Um, it's an organ that you can't live without regulates our blood sugar, uh, produces critical, critical enzymes. So here's the bicarbonate and enzyme list. Amylase, lipase, proteases, which are protein digesting. Now, if you're going to remember a protein digesting one, remember trypsin, because that's the key one I'll expect you to know. The pancreatic duct, all the cells send their goodness here, and it comes out through these little papillae, little like spigots, little spouts. And not only is the chyme neutralized, but now we've got the breakdown of proteins and carbohydrates and yes. Well, and we also have some bile coming down to help emulsify. So the if you look at the liver um, as a principal filter organ, you just can't live without it. It's just absolutely critical. Um, filter organ helping with homeostasis and from the digestive system if you follow this arrow when the uh, digestive system works over the nutrients it goes to the liver to be checked out like to be inspected almost like at the border to detoxify anything that could have ended up in our bloodstream from what we ate so the liver is pretty darn important not only is it a filter organ, but detoxifying, and it's producing bile. And here you can see um, the vessels that will help to fill the gallbladder. It is important to mention at this point that you can live without a gallbladder. Because if you look right here, this is the common bile duct. If you have gallstones and they remove this, cut that out, which is called an ectomy, um, this can deliver bile directly you don't have to have this okay but uh, gallstones can happen and gallstones are sometimes produced um, basically they're uh, small protein precipitates and they begin to form like that and once you get little stones a lot of these pass out naturally but some can get quite large and jagged and rough and um, it, it could cause inflammation of this. My wife, for example, has had this removed. 
second here. Ah, there we go. Back to where I wanted to be. So you can see this is just a storage receptacle. It doesn't actually make the bile. But now that we've studied cholecystokinin, we see that that is stimulated by the presence of fat here to release its payload, which is good. Now we actually have emulsification and fat can be properly digested. Now that this has finished its digestion, you move into the jejunum or the second part of the small intestine and you move around and around and around and there's some absorption, more mixing, until you get to, takes a little while, we'll get to the ileum which is the third part and this is where the majority of the absorption goes on. Woo, look at it go. Until you get to that ileocecal valve there, really nice shot of it. There's your appendix. So you can see that little opening there. So the large intestine, um, you've got the absorption of water. Uh, in that water, you're going to find fatty acids. But we want to absorb the water as best we can. And as that happens, you get the, for the production of stool, a.k.a. feces. Um, as you're watching, you can see the, the million names. The different flexures, that's the hepatic, that's the splenic. And we'll come down the descending colon until you get to the sigmoid colon region here. And now you're in the rectum. And feces will build up here. And as pressure begins to uh, exert itself on the anus, you'll feel that urge like you have to go um, to the point where you'll literally have to go. But relaxation of the sphincter muscles or circular muscles results in defecation. True story. Okay. I didn't actually need that one. I always liked this. I forgot to show this to you, but um, when you swallow, in the Magic School Bus, they talked about the fact that they felt like they were being squeezed like a tube of toothpaste, right? Um, that's peristalsis. It's a neat little view. And that will largely take us to the end of this portion of the lecture. There's, I didn't do any formal notes. I just wanted to give you a nice overview of the digestive system. So I hope you enjoyed it. Um, I enjoyed teaching it. Ciao. Thanks for listening.